All right, and I was just letting you know that this was taken from a larger paper, so if it feels a bit choppy, I do apologize for that. Restoration era poetry's fascination with reimagining and parodying earlier Roman forms was not limited to heroics, Georgics, and pastorals. Poetry about male impotence or sexual dysfunction, also known as imperfect enjoyment poems, sustained a popular revival among early modern Restoration and Augustan era writers, both British and continental. Impotency poems represent an intriguing facet of Restoration literature due to their often obscene content, which assaulted concepts of civility and decency in poetic language, as well as their consistent engagement with issues of social and political authority. This concern with political and social authority proves to be a generic convention of the impotency poem dating back to the impotency narratives that appeared in Roman love elegies, particularly Ovid's Amores. From within the tradition of the impotency poem, Rochester's The Imperfect Enjoyment exploits the underlying tensions of masculinity and its relation to civil and political authority through a reimagination of an Ovidian dramatic narrative about a male lover's inability to sexually perform at the critical moment. Ultimately, Rochester's poem uses the structure of the sexual anticlimax to create a pattern of reversal in agency and association, to subvert gender roles, and to reinforce socioeconomic structures through a failure of genteel masculinity. Although Rochester's imperfect impotency poem affirms contemporary political authority, as opposed to the subversion of Augustan politics seen in Ovid's piece, both writers engage in a negotiation of political spaces within an intimate context of a failed romantic encounter. To read the Amores as a political text requires a defense of the poem, as the poem does not deal with political themes in a largely obvious or explicit way. The association of the epic of political and military valor and the elegy with personal themes and passivity becomes a point by which Ovid can subvert political discourse through the adoption of the elegiac mode. Because the epic poem was so powerfully aligned with the creation of military heroes and the justification of political conquest, the decision, quote, to write elegy was to reject the most prestigious of all literary genres, epic poetry. For Augustan poets, to renounce epic was also to renounce Augustan themes, end quote. Reading the choice of elegy as a political action in and of itself, scholar P.J. Davis demonstrates how Ovid's rejection of the epic form in favor of the elegy represents a concern for the speaker in Book One, Elegy One, and reappears throughout the Amores. As such, Ovid's impotency narrative becomes a means of expressing a failed masculinity that corresponds to a failure, or in Ovid's case, an unwillingness, to respond appropriately to certain civic and pol political duties. In this way, Ovid establishes another convention of the impotency poem by demonstrating how the failure of a form of masculinity within a personal context becomes a means of expressing anxieties or frustrations about masculine performance within a larger political context. Rochester's The Imperfect Enjoyment adopts this convention, as do other Restoration Era authors writing in the impotency poem genre. The Imperfect Enjoyment represents a sophisticated response to the tradition of impotency poetry through its incorporation of conventional generic tropes, as well as its innovative structure, which uses the sexual anticlimax as a point of reversal for the hierarchies and associations crafted within the poem. At the beginning of the poem, Rochester establishes a somewhat egalitarian power relationship through the structure of his lines. Like Ovid before him, Rochester produces a sexual encounter that emphasizes the equal engagement of the couple involved, arguing that both lovers were, quote, equally inspired with eager fire, end quote. The speaker of the poem stresses the mutuality of their affection, creating a tangled image of, quote, arms, legs, lips, clothes clinging to embrace, end quote. The structure of line five creates a zugma, which catalogs the body parts in chaotic order, highlighting the frenzy of the activity of the romantic encounter, but minimizing the textual focus on specific subject or agent. If at all, the grammatical agent of the poem in the early lines is the female lover, Corona, who, quote, clips me to her breast and sucks me to her face. Her nimble tongue loves lesser lightning played within my mouth and to my thoughts conveyed, end quote. In this section, Corna is placed in the active subject position and the speaker is the object of her affection and caresses. Corna's activity in Rochester's poem is also coupled with her portrayal as a thoroughly physical and embodied figure. The speaker of Rochester's The Imperfect Enjoyment creates a dichotomy between materiality and immateriality, establishing herself, himself as immaterial. The speaker describes, quote, my fluttering soul sprung with paint, the painted kiss, hangs hovering o'er her balmy brinks of bliss. But whilst her busy hand would guide that part, which should convey my soul up to her heart. And here the speaker describes himself as a soul who is positioned, quote, fluttering above the sexual scene. 
Corinna, on the other hand, is emphasized materially as, quote, balmy brinks of bliss. The use of the word balmy, in particular, emphasizes the physicality of Corinna, drawing attention to the qualities of physical senses. These paired images of materiality and immateriality abound within these short lines, appearing again in line 14 as the speaker's soul is juxtaposed with Corinna's heart. The contrast between the immaterial and material images creates a hierarchy which subjugates Corinna to her own physicality, a gendered assumption which would have nevertheless been fairly common in Rochester's time. The culmination of Corinna's embodiment with her, quote, hand, her foot, her very looks, a cunt, end quote, occurs shortly after the speaker's premature ejaculation and illustrates that her materiality has become so extreme that her vagina has to become her metonymical representation, conflating her very identity with her sexual organ. This is an exaggerated moment of materiality. It occurs shortly before the poem's jerk. Uh, that this is an exaggerated moment of materiality. It occurs shortly before the poem's reversal suggests also the instability of the hierarchy between immaterial and material. The speaker's premature ejaculation becomes a textual moment from which the assumptions and patterns of the first 15 lines are reversed, initiating the impotency reflection. Similar to Ovid's impotency poem, where the speaker's failure occurs near the beginning of the poem, Rochester speaker enjoys the loving encounter only briefly before, quote, in liquid raptures I dissolve all o'er, melt into sperm and spend at every pore, end quote. The speaker adopts the active position in the line, I dissolve all o'er, functioning as the grammatical agent of the sentence. This stands in contrast to the passivity of the speaker before his dissolution. As the poem progresses, the speaker will retain this active position on a fairly consistent basis, almost entirely abandoning coronet. He makes scattered references to her as an object, but almost never as a subject. The speaker also begins to emphasize his own physicality, culminating with the absurd equivocation between himself and his member. Beginning at line 46, the speaker establishes a separation between his penis and himself, apostrophizing his penis as, quote, thou treacherous base deserter of my flame, end quote. <laughs> this apostrophization, another poetic convention derived from Ovid's apostrophization of the male member, might seem like a rhetorical strategy designed to distance the speaker from his masculine failure. As the narrative continues, however, it becomes apparent that the character of the penis has become a synecdoche for the speaker himself. Recalling previous sexual conquests, yet another trope derived from Ovid, the speaker asks, quote, What oyster, cinder, beggar, common whore, didst thou out ever fail in all thy life before? When vice, disease, and scandal lead the way, with what officious haste dost thou obey? End quote. Although the speaker refers to these incidents as if they were the recollections from the penis' experiences, their metonymic effect informs the reader that it is the speaker's past that is actually at stake. The conquests and failures of the penis are the conquests and failures of the speaker himself. It is at this moment that the materialization of the speaker is complete. The speaker has effectively become his penis and is now utterly physical. By contrast, Corna is made immaterial when she becomes, quote, love, unquote, for which the impotent member is unable to perform. Equally extreme, Corna's transformation into the immaterial effectively removes her from the poem in body and presence. Instead, the idea of Corna remains hovering above the reflections of the speaker, much in the same way that his soul hovered over their lovemaking before the reversal. Through these parallel devices, Rochester emphasizes the completeness of the reversal following the anticlimax, bringing the connection between impotence and the disruption of hierarchies to the forefront of consideration. While his reversal of agency and materiality following the episode of sexual dysfunction clearly disrupts gender hierarchies and ideas about masculine sexual agency, his conversation is not limited to hierarchies within a personal sphere. Rather, in the tradition of Ovid, Rochester presents an image of failed masculinity that enters into the political realm, reinforcing hierarchies of political and economic authority through his inability to perform politically appropriate gestures of masculinity. Rochester's entrance into a socioeconomic discourse becomes apparent through his assignment of class-based significance to the various sexual episodes that the speaker recalls. Amidst the speaker's diatribe against the failings of his sexual organ, he refers to his penis as being, quote, like a rude roaring Hector in the streets who scuffles, cuffs, and jostles all he meets. But if his king or country claim his aid, the rake shall vell and hide, shakes and hides his head, end quote. The reference to a Hector denotes a particularly lower class debauchee. The images of a rough lower class bully is immediately contrasted with a specifically political and military act of valor that the penis fails to perform. In this way, the actual impotence of the penis becomes a medical expression for his larger impotence in civil masculine valor. 
the impotence in Rochester's poem, in spite of its generally subversive associations, reinforces a class and politicized masculinity that supersedes the masculinity of lower classes because the speaker's dysfunction is framed as a failure to participate in a higher order of elevated civil and political masculinity. The tensions in Rochester's poem, tensions that resemble those appearing in Ovid's Amores, nevertheless create political stability through their assertion of a failed masculinity. Rochester's work derives from Ovid's project of satirizing political masculinity and undermining Augustine's role. Despite this variance, or perhaps because of it, the imperfect enjoyment remains a significant 18th century revival of a classical text, not only because of its adherence to the generic conventions of Ovid's work, Ovid's work but because of the way it engages with central questions and tensions of the genre. Through its close relation to the infants of the elegid, in Ovid's and Mori's particularly, Rochester engages with generic modes and conventions to interrogate the rich literary tradition of impotency literature and to revitalize it with the concerns of his own time. As such, Rochester's The Imperfect Enjoyment ultimately proves to be an invaluable participant in a dominant 18th century literary project, a project where the return to classical forms was not simply imitation, but an active means of negotiating a cultural and literary context that lived in conversation with those classical contexts that shape Western literature.